The Battle of Antietam in 1862 was the bloodiest day of the Civil War. In 12 hours, there were 10,000 Confederate ca casualties, and even more on the Union side. One historian wrote this about the battle. At last the sun went down and the battle ended. Smoke heavy in the air, the twilight quivering with the anguished cries of thousands of wounded men. And though the battle appeared to be a draw, Union General George McClellan was able to end Robert E. Lee's thrust into Maryland, forcing him to retreat across the Potomac River. This was possible because two Union soldiers found a copy of Lee's battle plans and delivered them to McClellan before the battle occurred. When we enter scripture and begin studying and hearing about our enemy, God has given us the battle plans of our enemy. That we might know his tactics and how he works, that we can recognize his ways. And that we can know, according to God's word, what our plan for victory is. And so today we see a battle of supernatural proportions. Moses throws down the staff, becomes a snake. Pharaoh's magicians throw down. Their staffs become snakes. And so, in conflicts like this, confident faith is challenged. God's people. And proud hearts are hardened. So how will you stand in the battle for your heart? Because that's what the enemy is trying to do. Is discourage your heart. Or to harden your heart. Or to dishearten you from following the Lord altogether. This battle begins with two old men. 80 and 83 years old. Imagine that. Two old men with God versus Pharaoh with all the power of Egypt and hell behind him. And so, when we see the false sign, when we see the magicians throw down their staffs and they become snakes, the thought is, who's, who's the false sign for? Why are they doing this? Well, the Israelites weren't in the room. They were in Goshen. But those that were in the room, the servants of Pharaoh and Pharaoh and the magicians and Aaron and Moses, that's who the signs were for. Now, primarily, the signs were to deceive Pharaoh, to get him not to listen to the Lord. And those signs were effective in that purpose, as we see he hardened his heart. But also, those false signs were to dishearten God's servants. Maybe you've been there before, where the enemy has thrown out some tactic, some lie, some evidence that seems to discount your faith, and you feel shaken, and you're not sure how to respond, and you feel like your foundation has been knocked out from under you, and your heart begins to fear. Well, this battle for your heart rages every day. You know, the enemy doesn't get tired in pursuing those hearts that belong to God. Satan and his minions are busy all the time. And they never let up. And that is his joy and his hope is to pull you away from God. And so we see in scripture he's like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he prowls around throughout the earth. And so Satan, though, is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all the time. Although somebody might say, well, Satan, you know, turned that light red and messed up my commute to work. Or, you know, we blame everything on Satan. But Satan is a being who's limited by space and time. But he does have minions, demons, that are at work as well. The Bible calls Satan... The God of this age, little g God that is, who's deceived the, the world and who's at work here. And Christ, though, is the victorious conquering king who is returning to claim that which he won with his blood. 
Well, today we're going to look at three things with regards to this spiritual battle. And the first is that Satan's tactics are like this. He loves to use supernatural substitutes or false miracles, false signs. And understand, these aren't cheap tricks. These are spiritual powers that accomplish things in this world that appear to be perhaps the same power that God's servants use, but we see behind the scenes in chapters like this. And we see that that power isn't actually from God. That power is from the evil one. And it's real, and it is supernatural. First we see the staff turn into a snake. And the magicians do the same. Then we see in the first plague that occurs, the water being turned into blood. In Exodus 7, chapter 20, you might just jump down there with your eyes and see where it says, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile. And all of the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died. And the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt, but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh, his heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said would happen, of course. So the first plague, they counterfeit as well. The second plague of frogs, Look in chapter 8, verse 6. It says, So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come upon the land of Egypt. And again, they counterfeited a work of God. Now the thing they could not do was make the Nile turn back from blood into normal water. The thing they could not do was make the frogs go away. So there were limitations. But the third plague, we see God defeat their power. If you look at verse 18 of chapter 8, it says, So the magicians tried by their secret arts to produce this plague of gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. And the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. It's like they finally say, we give. Our power, we can do certain things, but God's power is so much more powerful, it's infinite. It's beyond our understanding. And so, though God's power be infinitely greater, you see here, Pharaoh still hardens his heart. Now, one other thing about Satan being a created being, he likes to use small amounts of power to entertain hard hearts. And so we see that happen in the occult. People get involved with the occult and they learn certain things and gain certain power, if you will, and it feeds the pride. And it makes them feel like they're powerful or in control, but the reality is that Satan is gaining control over them. And though the occult be, in this day and age, among the youth, a very attractive religion. We see it in movies, we see it in books. Um, I think it was in the year 2000, um, in England, there, was, there had been a big resurgence of the occult through things like Buffy, Bam Vampire Slayer, and even more so today, with Harry Potter and so on, but somebody who was in the occult and working with youth and training them in the occult had said that they had picked up where the church had left off, where the church had failed. And so they were feeling a hole, they were feeling a need. But the occult is attractive. Whether it be white magic or black magic, it all has the same source, Satan. And so, maybe you've had experience in this area. Ouija boards, horoscopes, spell books, tarot cards, 
palm readers, psychics, seances, secret ceremonies. I mean, we can go on. Those things are out there, and they're prevalent. Be careful. Be mindful. Don't forget the source of their influence. The magicians finally admitted that their power or God's power was beyond the demonic powers that they possessed. But Pharaoh refused to listen. Pharaoh was not a skeptic. Don't get me wrong when we say that. Uh, skeptics oftentimes um, will say, well, I don't believe that because I have evidence of the contrary or so on. But Pharaoh at this point, all the evidence that he had stacked up against believing in God was removed. Even his own magicians admitted that God is real and God is powerful. And he went from being a skeptic, if he even was, to being a blatant unbeliever. Unsubmitted. Unwilling to give over his heart. And so, when people won't believe, and maybe you have family members you're praying for, or friends you're reaching out to, understand that skepticism is usually not the problem. Or evidence to support Christianity is usually not the problem. Usually the problem comes down to one thing, and that is the heart. The heart. I haven't met one person who has come to Christ because of mere evidence. And though evidence is important because the truth should be reflected in reality, and it is, what brings people to Christ? It's when God changes their heart. It's when you reach out with the love of Christ and people are touched and their heart changes and all of a sudden, like that video we saw, their thinking is reversed. The things they used to be so adamantly against, now they so fully proclaim is something they believe. And so understand that battle that's going on around us all the time, whether it be somebody saying, I don't believe in God, or I'm an agnostic, or I'm a skeptic, or whatever it is, it comes down to the heart. And so Satan knows. When somebody does not want to believe because their heart is wrong, and he throws out a little evidence to the contrary, like some uh, of these miracles, Pharaoh is quick to jump on board. He's quick to say, well, yeah, that's why I don't serve this God, Yahweh. It's because my magicians have the same power. And so Satan, when he's working to win over hearts, and somebody won't accept Jesus because of their heart, they're looking for reasons not to believe. Satan is happy to oblige. Well, let me give you some reasons. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, we see the way that he works. It says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so, that's one of the powers that Satan has, is to blind eyes, to darken minds, and to harden hearts. But, God's Spirit is so powerful that when His Word is spoken, He can pierce through the deadness and bring light. He can reach in and open your eyes so that you can hear the Gospel and understand it. And so, when we're trying to win over a heart for Christ, we need to be in prayer, because it's not your great arguments that will win people over. It is the power of the Spirit through the Gospel. And so, in trying to reach others, we need to pray for the Spirit to work, and we need to pray for softened hearts, because there are times when the Spirit is speaking loud and strong, and people remain hard. In Acts 7.51, um, Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church, he's preaching to the religious leaders, and it was a pretty fiery sermon, and you can tell by these words, in Acts 7.51, he said to them, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's working and revealing through the word, yet they harden their heart close off their ears. 
as your fathers did, so do you. And, you know, they killed him for that kind of message. But, when we look at our world today, you know, you look at a story like this, and the, the thought is, well, that kind of stuff never happens today. I never see the power of Satan coming out in, in these false miracles or whatever. I've never seen a false sign or wonder that has made me go, wow, you know. Could it happen today? Well, we're told in Scripture that it will. First of all, if we go to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 13, we're told that there will be prophets that arise that have power. In, from the spiritual realm, they have a power to do things miraculously, yet it's not a miracle from God. It says, if a prophet or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, so he actually does a miracle or something. If he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And so there's the battle of the heart. The false wonder comes out and God is testing to see whether you love him with all your heart. Because the false prophets, though they might have a power, how do you know if a miracle is real or not? Well, listen to the message. If their message then draws you away from Christ, then you know that the miracle or the prophet is false. Now we're told also that Satan does work in Ways that you wouldn't expect. You know, sometimes we, we think of Satan. If you ran into him in an alley, you know, he would be wearing a red jumpsuit with horns and a pitchfork. Or he would be all dark and gnarly teeth coming out. And, you know, it would smell like sulfur coming out of his breath and be scary and stuff. But that's not what Scripture says. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, it says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as a what? angel of life. And so there's this deception involved, not only using false miracles that appear to be from God, but aren't. There's a deception that comes in the appearance, the manifestation, where it looks like it's from heaven, but it's from the pit of hell. Be careful. Matthew 24, 24, this is the words of Christ. He says, For false Christ and prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. He's talking about what's going to be happening in the last days. We are in the last days. Amen. The tribulation, the ultimate appearance of the Antichrist and all these, um, the intensity of the false miracles and so on hasn't yet arrived, but we are living in those last days and you may begin to see an increasing of these sorts of things. I mean, imagine if a miracle worker showed up today, was able to heal cancer and uh, bring back limbs that had uh, been cut off. Uh, people would flock to listen to what the person had to say, but Christ says, beware. 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the coming of the lawless one will be, or is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders. And so when the lawless one or the Antichrist arrives, it will be in accordance with, he will do these great signs and wonders. Why would the world follow this man? Well, because he will appear powerful. He will appear to be a prophet. And the word Antichrist, although many times we think anti means against Jesus, anti in the Greek means in place of, not against. So, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to come as a Christ figure in place of Christ. So we need to be sharp, and we need to be on our guard, and to know how to discern between true and false, whether it be prophecies or miracles, anything that's from the supernatural. When you read the book of Revelation, I think the thing that always blows me away or confuses me is that through the whole time where God is sending judgments down instead of people repenting what we see is people becoming 
harder. So much so that to the end, when you see the Battle of Armageddon, all the nations are gathered together and Christ arrives and they try to fight Jesus. Crazy. But that's how hard they are. Well, supernatural power is not definitive proof that that person doing those things is teaching the truth. Be careful. We're not at the mercy of experience of an unexplainable phenomenon, though. Don't be scared by it. You know, Moses and Aaron didn't run away, screaming like little girls. They stood their ground. They fought the battle. And so today, although we're not at the mercy of these unexplainable phenomenon, we do have in our hands the tool to discern right and wrong. And that's the Word of God. That which you hold in your hands, the Bible, the Word of God, is living and acting. We're told. It's our standard for faith and practice. It's our spiritual sword in the armor of God. And with that, you can fight and combat the lies of the enemy. Well, the second thing we see from this battle that I want to point out is that we need to be not only aware that the enemy has supernatural substitutes, but he also has counterfeit truth. Counterfeit miracles, but counterfeit truth. False prophets and false teachers are many today. And you might not recognize them right away, but when these false teachers come to us today, I believe they come by more common means. <laughs> Using the tactics of, say, feel good, positive message, or teachings that tickle itching ears, or basically what that means is they tell you what you want to hear, giving you permission to do the things you want to do that you know are wrong, and then if a teacher says, oh no, that's okay, according to my teaching, then people flock to that teacher. False teachers, one of the things we see in the New Testament is that they see their teaching ministry as an opportunity for financial gain. So you'll see greed as the mark of pretty much every false teacher in the New Testament. Greed. Money. They fleece the flood. Well, make no mistake, the source of their power is the same as those magicians that went against Moses. In 1 Timothy 4.1, it says this. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, today, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of what? Demons. So, the counterfeit truth, the false teaching, where does it come from? The supernatural. It comes from demons. False teachers are actually likened to the ma Egyptian magicians in 2 Timothy. And I want to read this to you for sure because this links the New Testament teaching of false teachers with this story directly. 2 Timothy 3, 6 through 9. And it describes some of the false teachers uh, and how they work. It says, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And here it is. Just as James and Jambres. Now, those are names that were given to those magicians by um, Jewish tradition. Just as these guys, James and Jambres, opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all as was that of those two men. Recognize it for what it is. When it comes, pray for discernment to point it out. Now today there's kind of a, a pressure to say that nobody's wrong. You know, everybody that has a church or that is doing ministry, that they're all right. Now I'm not saying that we should go on a crusade and start attacking everybody. <laughs> but we should be able to be discerning enough to not 
with a stamp of approval on everything. Don't put up with false teaching in the sense of don't spend your time listening to it and uh, entertaining yourself with it. 2 Corinthians 11, 3-4. Uh, Paul is confronting the Corinthians because they're putting up with false teachers. Uh, they're allowing them to have access to the pulpit and teach the body. And he says this, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts are being led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, so it's not the Jesus you see in the New Testament, it's a different definition of Jesus, than the one we proclaimed. Or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received through hearing the gospel. So it's a spirit that works in a different way. You know, that is just the burning in the bosom or something. You know, the spirit that uh, it's some spirit. Or, if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. He said, watch out. Those three things. Uh, false teachers will come with those three things oftentimes. Or cults will start with those three things. A different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. And so the different gospel being that there are many ways to heaven that you can earn your own way to heaven, that you don't need just Jesus to get to heaven, or you need Jesus and their special teaching or product to get to heaven. And so watch out for those three things. Now, sometimes false teachers are a little harder to spot, because although they teach the correct doctrine, they're false teachers in the sense that they don't live the correct lifestyle. Be mindful of these things. Doctrine should match life. And life doctrine. And if you don't see those two in your teacher, then find another one. It says in Titus 1, 15 through 16, the, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Uh, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their, what? Works. Works. So they profess to know God, and they say the right things, but they deny him by the way that they live. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Wow. Bet you didn't know these. all these verses were in the New Testament. I know, you know, a lot of times it's nice to come to church and get the... Um, encouraging verses, you know, the ones that make you feel better. Uh, but some of these are just like, wow. But we got to go over them once in a while, right? To be able to maintain the edge in the battle. Greed is a motivation of false teachers. I had said that earlier, but where it comes from is 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5, and it ends there saying, imagining that greed, godliness is a means for Gain. Let's see. I got a bunch of verses, but I'm going to skip them. <laughs> but as you're in this battle, and it might be a little intimidating, just as it may have been for Moses and Aaron when those three staffs became snakes before you, what happened at the end of that story? Moses' staff eight, the other three. God overcame. And that's what the way it is with you. You might be standing there uh, intimidated and scared, not knowing what to say or feeling like you don't have the scriptural knowledge. But you know what? We have a helper. We have a savior. We have a God who will overcome. And he is able to keep us faithful in the midst of the battle if you rely on him and lean on him. I wanted to read to you two verses out of 1 John because there was a false teaching going around and, and John was trying to encourage the church. How do you stand in the midst of this? And first he says in 1 John 2, 26-27, something very empowering to us as believers. It says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. 
So if you receive Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as he taught you, abide in him. Remain in Christ. Follow the Spirit. And he will give you exactly what you need. But it's when we say to ourselves, is there any other voice out there? Is there any other ideas that you can share with me out there, anybody? You know, and, and we start looking for the answer somewhere else. You know, if you seek God and you pray and you read His Word, He's faithful to teach you what you need to know. And He's faithful to expose the false teaching. We have everything inside of us already. That's good news. That's empowering, isn't it? Yeah. Don't be afraid. But then also another reason not to be afraid. Later on in 1 John, he says in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, and I like how he addresses them, little children, you know, the children of God, a term of endearment. He's speaking to them out of love. He says, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world. And the world listens to them. But we are from God. Whoever knows God, listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Good news. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And he has overcome. And the Bible calls us in Romans chapter 8, more than conquerors. We talked about that last week. More than conquerors in Christ. And so the battle going on around you is for your heart. There will be counterfeit truth that tries to win over your heart through entertainment, through giving you permission to explore your passions, to pressure you from the so-called wise, and you are not so wise, so you need to learn their ways. We know that's a lie. Spirits in us. We have everything we need to teach us. But the enemy, and this is how he's worked for years and years, if he says it loud enough, long enough, eventually, people give in. So recognize the battle for your heart and stand true in your devotion to Christ. You know, rely on him. He's given you everything you need. And don't do it alone. Moses was with Aaron, and they both had God. You know, if you're struggling and you're going through some hard stuff, whether it be some supernatural thing happening or some more common false teaching, um, share it with a brother or a sister. Um, come and talk to me or Jack or um, Isaac or Scott or, or anybody that knows the word. Well, the last thing we see happens after this little battle. There's another battle that occurs a little later, but it's in connection to that same enemy that is trying to win over the hearts of God's people. And here it is. If the enemy can't get you with supernatural power, and if he can't get you with counterfeit truth, this is his next tactic to try to get you through compromise. If you were to jump down in Exodus um, to chapter 8, verse 25, we see Pharaoh try the tactic of compromise. It says, Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. Now, they were supposed to go three days' journey into the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Why don't you just hang out here? That way you don't have to go all the way. Don't go all the way. Don't be a fanatic. Let's be reasonable about this. But Moses said, I will not, or would not be right to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey. And there he is, quoting God's command. We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord, 
our God as He tells us. Not as you tell us, Pharaoh. So Pharaoh's asking Israel to not go all the way. To compromise with the world. Now, if you think about it and you reasoned it out a little bit, you might be able to get yourself to believe, if you were Moses, that, well, this we get the best of both worlds. We get the approval of Pharaoh, and this battle stops, and we do what God asked us to do, and so it looks good. Be careful of compromise. Because one of the things about the compromise in our faith is to do things for the outward appearance. That it might look good to you, and it might look good to the world, but it doesn't look so good to God. Well, God did walk on this earth in the form of Christ, and he came across some religious folks that had compromised in their hearts. In Matthew 15, 7 through 9, um, he starts off with a real gentle phrase. You hypocrites! <laughs> Jesus spoke like that? Yeah, well, to the religious people he did. To the sinners, he was always gracious and gentle because they were humble and they knew they were sinners. These guys were sinners and they didn't know. And they were leading other people astray. So Jesus was real rough with them. You hypocrites. Uh, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so they had gotten into that place where they could say things with their mouth and they could do things outwardly in the religious sense, but have their hearts far from God. And that would have been what Moses would have done with the Israelites if they stayed and compromised. They would have done something that looked religious, but their hearts were far from God. Thank God they didn't do that. There's a story of a guy that compromised in the Bible, and his name is King Saul. Saul was chosen by God to be the first king. And at one point during his reign, the Philistines mustered up so many troops that the Bible says they were like, sand on the seashore. And they came to fight with the Israelites. And so Israel saw that they were in trouble, and these brave soldiers went and hid in caves and holes and rocks and tombs and cisterns. I mean, I thought the list would end, and I'm reading through it. Cistern, and wow. Some of them even ran across the Jordan River. And why? Because they were all scared. Now, everybody with King Saul that still hung out with him were, were shaking in their boots or sandals, whatever they were. Now, the one thing they were supposed to do was wait for seven days until Samuel the prophet came. And Samuel said, I want you guys to wait for seven days, and when I arrive, I will offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Seven days go by. And Saul begins to get a little nervous, as well as his troops, of course. And it seemed good to himself to offer the sacrifice himself. And so he compromised. He said, okay, I got the pressure from the troops on this side, and I'm scared of the enemy on that side, and so I'm going to choose to take it upon myself to offer a sacrifice and try to uh, make God help us be victorious against the enemy and also help my troops to come back and, and uh, not be scared anymore. So he takes it upon himself and does this. And as soon as he finishes, and that's just the way it happens all the time, isn't it? As soon as he's done, up comes walking Samuel. And Samuel wasn't very happy. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 13, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God which, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own what? heart. I want a man that seeks me with his whole heart, not half his heart. 
Saul did not go all the way. And he suffered because of it. And the enemy today is tempting you as you become effective for the kingdom. As you take your stand against um, false wonders and false teaching, his next tactic will be to get you to compromise. It'll look okay to the people around you. You might be able to maintain your ministry as a ministry leader or the respect as the father of your family or whatever, but God knows and you know where your heart's at. And so what God requires of us is wholehearted devotion. It's one thing about fighting the good fight. This morning at our devotional service with all the people that serve on Sunday morning, we always meet at 9.15, which you guys are all welcome to join us, but we've been going through 1 Timothy, and um, Paul says, fight the good fight. Something about a fight is that, number one, there's an opposition, which sometimes we don't like to admit. You know, I want to be friends with everybody and make everybody happy, but no, if you're fighting the good fight, there's an opposition, you have to recognize that. But also, something else about a fight is you don't step into a fight half-heartedly. If you do, you're going to get whomped. Yep. If you throw a punch, you better be able to back it up, right? Yeah. And so, you start fighting the good fight, and it takes absolute commitment. It, you have to throw your whole self behind the fight. And that's what it's like in this battle against the enemy. You can't go half-hearted. It has to be all the way wholehearted. And so not going all the way means you don't go at all. And that's where the enemy knows he's, he's got you. The cost of following Christ is everything. You know, when Jesus called the disciples and then other people to follow him, uh, there's something that he said that's very clear in Luke 9.23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. There's a wholehearted decision that throws everything of your life behind it in picking up a cross, an instrument of execution, saying, I'm going to deny my old life, I'm going to follow you, Lord. Notice the word daily. Every day. Sometimes you wake up, the alarm goes off. My alarm's the motorcycle sound on the iPhone. <laughs> you know, it reminds me i got to get revved up for the day. No. Uh, and you wake up in the morning and you're thinking, oh great, not another day. And the temptation is to get out of that bed and let your heat, feet hit the floor without first picking up the cross and re remembering that today is the day that belongs to the Lord. My life was purchased with His blood. And when I go to work in the morning, when I get up out of this bed and face my kids and, and the day, that this day begins by following Christ. And one of the best ways to do that, I, at least in my own life, is I like to get up before everybody else gets up and crack open my Bible and spend some time with God. You know, I do a little tweeting through the Psalms, you know, so the all the twits out there can follow the tweets. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Tweeting through the Psalms, you know? And then I'll, I'll read a... I've been challenging myself lately with reading one book of the Bible a day. And so I've been reading all the small ones. That's easy. But <laughs> and, uh, and then read something else and, and spend some time praying. And, you know, God's always faithful to show me something that I need for the day. And um, you start best way to start the day. And I have to confess, er, not every day do I do that. Sometimes I wake up late and i got to start running, but i, I got to say that my, that day is not so good compared to the other days. But the enemy is fighting to put pressure on your heart to compromise. And he'll use greed. He'll use lust. He'll use power, pleasure, addiction, fear, anger, Refusal to forgive, gluttony, intellectualism, 
in place of spirituality. You know, he'll, he'll try all these other things to take the place that God is supposed to have in your life. Apply any amount of pressure to get you to say, Uncle, I give. Now James tells us something really cool. In James 4, 7 through 8, he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you. That's good news. But the first step is submit yourself to God. Put God first in your life. Then uh, resist the devil, and he will flee. (coughs) Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you what? Double-minded. If you've compromised, it's time to get all on for Christ again. To say, Lord, I'm going to go all the way for you. No longer am I going to let Pharaoh scare me into going halfway. Because that's where the battle will go. The stronger you are, you'll look for that weakness, the chink in your armor. that leads straight to your heart. And so we stand strong. And so, fight with the Word of God. You know, if you need to discern what's going on, go to the Word. But there is one who came to deliver you. One who came to fight for you. And his name is Jesus Christ. The Prince of Darkness, maybe has darkened your eyes. Maybe has blinded you and tried to lure you away or clog up your heart with other things. But Christ came to deliver you. Christ came as the victor for you. And if you've been being pwned by the enemy, whether you've never come to Christ or whether you have and you have compromised, we have a Savior who's patient, who is kind and humble, Shows his favor to those who are broken hearted. And when you come before him and express your need for a Savior, maybe you've been involved in witchcraft or secret arts like those magicians in your past. Christ came to deliver you. And he can. From those forces of darkness. Hebrews 4 7 says he appoints a certain day today saying that through David so long ago afterwards, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart like Pharaoh. Today, if you hear his voice, allow him to come into your heart. If you can hear it, that's the grace of God. He's removed the blinders so that you can see, and so he's already working at moving the power of the enemy aside. And the Spirit's speaking, and Christ's power is tugging on your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden it. Enter the victory that comes with knowing Christ. Let's pray. If you need to be delivered today by Jesus, the only deliverer, pray with me this prayer. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner, that I do need a Savior. And I recognize that you died for my sin on the cross, Lord. I receive the payment that you gave for me. And today, I pick up my cross, deny myself to follow you all the days of my life. Give me strength. Spirit, fill me up. Thank you that I stand in the victory today. And Lord, for all of us, we just pray that you give us the strength to fight this battle. Lord, help us to keep our hearts fully set upon you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.